Good morning, everybody. I am very delighted to be able to introduce to you this morning our, our final vision speaker for the NACIG conference here in Albuquerque. Uh, Jim O'Donnell is the university librarian at Arizona State University, and I was informed that he gets hives when anybody talks too much about him. So I'm going to leave it at that and let him get to the talking. <laughs> Thank you and good morning everybody. If I seem more relaxed than I might otherwise be, it's because I'm back in my home state briefly. I grew up a couple hundred miles south of here and I always feel better when my clock is running on Mountain Standard Time for some reason. I want to say first of all that I'm going to say things this morning by way of vision that will treat as inevitable or imminent or necessary things that you well know are just flat out impossible. And that's the tension between vision and reality. Um, I was in this room for the first session this morning being horrified, again, by the degree of petty, pettifogging detail that serials librarians have to go through to guarantee access for individual users to individual resources. And I sit, sat there shaking my head, saying to myself at the same time, this is necessary, this is the world we live in, and this is impossible, this is nuts, this has got to change. I don't know how to make it change. We work at it, obviously, incrementally at the margins. But it made me think again that some of the things I say will sound uh, simply too visionary, too idealistic to be possible. The one caution I would offer is that I say them because I think they are, if impossible, necessary. And that means that's where our work should be focused. So first of all, I want to call your attention to the slide I have on the screen now. Um, this is I'm meant to be the single most pedantic detail with which any keynote session at NASIG has ever begun. I want to tell you what the font is on my PowerPoint. <laughs> it's the special font you find deep in Microsoft called Bookman Old Style. I chose it because I begin with a photograph of a member of that species, bookman <laughs> old style, in his native habitat and native garb. He's in the stacks of the ASU library. There are a variety of things you might think about that slide, like are those little ASU sun devils on his necktie? They are. But I want you to put yourself in a metal time machine and go back to Princeton, New Jersey, 1948. Princeton 1948 is when Firestone Library, the great library that you can now visit there going through its umpteenth, this time 10 year long renovation, was opened. Princeton was probably one of the last of the great libraries to open a facility with open stacks browsable by users. Other libraries had gotten there sooner, but until 1948, Princeton still had creaky traditional closed stack facilities because they just couldn't find another way to do it. I want you to get in your time machine and go back to that moment and see that photograph. Pretend uh, that those are orange tigers on his tie instead and that you are seeing the first photograph ever taken from the Princeton Library 1948. What is in your mind as you see that picture? Gosh, you're saying, isn't modern technology wonderful? Isn't that just the most amazing high-tech user interface to knowledge ever imaginable? It doesn't get any better than that. That's what they said then, and they were right. And we've said it repeatedly since. Um, I encourage you, if you have some time, about 20 minutes, to look on the web for a film made in 1956 by the not yet famous film, French film director Alain René called Toutes les mémoires du monde the whole memory of the world, all the world's memory. It's a documentary about the Bibliothèque Nationale, vintage 1956. It's got subtitles for the French. And it too is a picture of modern technology at its greatest and best. The pneumatic tubes whisking pieces of paper from one place to another are meant to astonish you. We've got a video from the uh, the opening of Hayden Library at ASU in 1966 that's just the same way it emphasizes the new high-tech circulation system. Beware, that I should give a trigger warning for PTSD flashbacks here. There were punch cards on all the books. 
and the librarians had to figure out what to do with the punch cards. By the time I came along to the Penn Library 15 years after that, they were plucking the punch cards from the back of the book one at a time as you circulated them and converting them by putting stickers with barcode numbers on all of them. We've always lived in a high-tech world, but I want to linger on this high-tech world. That physical arrangement of books in library stacks is flat out just amazingly miraculous. It's an invention of the last 150 years. Before then, there were other cataloging systems, non-cataloging systems. In closed stack libraries, books could be arranged sometimes by accession number. And if you dig into the old volumes in some of our older libraries, you can find where they used to write the accession number, that is to say the serial number of this item in order of purchase uh, in the whole history of the library uh, on the side in the gutter somewhere around the copyright page. But we invented cataloging systems. We invented shelving systems. We had the brilliant idea of inventing open stacks. And so what you're looking there is a man surrounded by his discovery tools. Okay, we invented the phrase discovery tools a little bit after that. But that's what those open stacks were. They were places in which you could find stuff and be prompted to find stuff that you would never have found otherwise. The miracle of the card catalog went along with it, of course. All of these miracles have their negative effects. Um, one liberation we have achieved in moving from the card catalog to the online public access catalog is that we all bump backsides with strangers less often than we used to. This is good. But we could find these stacks as discovery tools in a variety of ways. We hear, of course, traditional users tell us that it's the only way you can possibly browse content. It's the only way scholarship can possibly advance. One caution is that before these buildings were opened in the first half of the 20th century, you couldn't do that, but scholarship somehow or another managed to advance. The other is that there are a variety of uses to which you can put these stacks. A favorite moment of mine came early in my career when I caught a student plagiarizing. I felt a little bit guilty about the situation the student had gotten herself into. I'd led a student with not enough preparation into a more advanced course, and when her paper showed up, it wasn't just that the paper was too good. The topic, which she hadn't consulted me about, was too good. It was a really good and interesting question. And she certainly hadn't thought that one up. So I scratched my head and I said, you know, that sounds like something Bill Friend would write. William H. C. Friend, professor of ecclesiastical history, University of Glasgow back in those days. Friend writes often in the Journal of Ecclesiastical History. I think I'll go to the stacks and rummage around in J.E.H. for a while and see if I can track this one down. So I went to the stacks, this was the Cornell University Library a long time ago, and found the Journal of Ecclesiastical History, and looked at the row of volumes on the shelves, they'd been recently reshelved, all smoothly in a row, with one volume obtruding by about three-eighths of an inch. <laughs> Popped it open, and approximately eight seconds later, that kid was busted because that's where the volume was. That's a discovery tool doing its job in a way the student never, never imagined. But remembering that student's experience is a way of remembering the downside uh, that these stacks always had. They gave you a long row of material with no tools for discriminating among them except those that you brought with you, and with the disadvantage that the good stuff very frequently wasn't there it had been checked out already. If Professor O'Donnell gave you a paper assignment and you were a little more dilatory than some others in getting to the stacks, by the time you got to, oh, I don't know, the Battle of Gettysburg shelves for the Civil War, a bunch of stuff had been taken by your classmates. And you might be the kind of student who would then see a book on the shelf that said, History of the Battle of Gettysburg, and grab it thankfully and rush it out of the building without slowing down to think that it had in fact been published in 1893, that perhaps we know more about the Battle of Gettysburg today, and perhaps wicked Professor O'Donnell wants you to have higher standards for the kind of information that you use. We like to bust on Wikipedia these days. We should remember that there are moments when Wikipedia is a better tool to use than the 1893 book that's left in the stacks for the latecomer to glean when they get there. Even for browsing. 
Um, if I'm, I'm there in the stacks around the DGs in the library, which is my home and native land, but if I wandered a few rows away from there and got an interest in Tibetan history that I've never had before, it's likely that the very book I most want to read about Tibetan history won't be there because it's the one somebody else will have checked out. These stacks are an imperfect representation of the world of knowledge. There's one more difficulty in that particular set. If you look at that photograph and then you compare with the fellow standing on the stage, you will realize that I'm not the shortest librarian in the forest, but those stacks loom tall above me. I'm not the widest librarian in the forest, but I fill up that aisle pretty well. I'm not used to doing that. But at Arizona State, our stacks are in fact too tall and our aisles are in fact too narrow, uh, following current standards for library stack arrangement, because we've had a lot of books and it made perfect sense once upon a time to crowd them a little closer together to pile them a little bit higher. Now, I am a gentleman of a certain age who has become increasingly aware in recent years that I have both bifocals and knees. <laughs> and I must confess that when I am in that aisle, my bifocals and my knees are not their happiest. <laughs> the top shelves, the bottom shelves pose particular challenges. I'm lucky that I'm 6'1". That means the top shelves are a little closer to me. Some people, I'm told, are not 6'1", and those top shelves are a little further away. I make do when I have to, but I often don't have to. Now, 1948, there were gentlemen of a certain age with bifocals and knees. They didn't even have the nice progressive bifocals that I have. But because this was a miracle of technology and access, they made do. They went and found a little stool and climbed up, they crunched down and sat on the floor, and they were delighted by what they were finding. But I'm struck that this photograph was taken about 20 yards from my desk. I'm a scholar whose dream has come true. My office is in the library. I've got a key to the building. I snuck in on Saturday when nobody was around this week. It was fabulous. But, or and, when I want a book from these shelves, which I say are my home and native land, this is where I get the good stuff for my scholarship. They're about 20 yards from where my desk is. The way I normally do it now is with a few clicks. I sit at my desk, I look it up in the OPAC, I click request, I click Hayden Library, I click this volume, and tomorrow morning when I'm coming into the library building, I stop at the front desk and say, you've got something for me. And sure enough, they've got something for me. Stack usage in our library um, has dropped sharply. Um, I have been prowling the stacks during business hours in the year and a half that I've been there. And I must report that the maximum, the minimum, the mean, the median, and the mode of the number of non-library employees I have seen in the stacks at any one time in that period of time are all the same number, one. The one time I ever found half a dozen students in the stacks at one time it turned out, I asked them that they had an assignment from a professor to go and find stuff. And the reason there were six of them was one of them was on crutches and the other five were the support group helping her get in and out of the building and handle the stuff and schlep her way in and out. Um, I said, you know, we have a disability services office at the front entrance and the correct and truthful answer was no, didn't know that. We could have offered a little more help. That's what brought the crowd to the stacks. If I, bookman old style, am not thronging those stacks, if the students are not thronging those stacks, we live already in a different space. Um, I've caught myself recently more than once making prophecies of the future. If a student can't find the book in digital form, they won't read it. Then realize that my prophecy takes the form of a descriptive statement about the present. If a student today doesn't find the book in digital form, the chances of reading it are far, far less than was once, than was once the case. Um, at ASU, we have already begun, of course, moving some of our collection off-site. Um, we built a stack tower in 1966. We built an underground facility between that stack tower and the location of the future stack tower in 1989. The future stack tower will now never be built. And so we have a Harvard repository off-site. Land is relatively cheap in Arizona. It's 25 miles away, but it takes no time at all. But with a, a capacity of one and a half million volumes, 
We're now approaching major renovation of this facility, and we are building two more modules of the high-density shelving that will effectively hold, for the purposes of the renovation, all of our print collection, or almost all of it. We have one other facility on the main campus that we will use during that time with a small number of hundreds of thousands of volumes out of our four and a half million volume collection. But it is our intention, taking our heart in our hands, to come back to this building and have only in the main tower a collection something on the order of 250 to 500,000. And we're working actively right now to strategize just what collection that should be. What collection can we and should we put on the shelves for 2020 to be there from 2020 to 2040 that won't simply be furniture, won't simply echo the title of Anthony Powell's famous novel, Books Do Furnish a Room, uh, won't be um, something to cast your eyes over as you drift off to sleep in an easy chair nearby, but will actually be used, will actually be engaged. One hint we have of that and the work we've done so far is that we think we should cycle books through on a programmatic basis more frequently rather than leave a core collection in one place to begin to compost. So maybe we should have a section of our print collection where we bring in books about Italy for six months and connect this with a series of lectures and events with our School of International Languages and Cultures. And then at the end of six months, cycle out Italy and bring in, I don't know, the semester of Darwin. In other words, make the print collection in the building active and alive in a way that catches the eye and engages the interest of our students as they come through the building. I said 2020 to 2040 a minute ago. I do believe that by that time, we will be thinking increasingly of the books that we have available in our main buildings on our central campuses as increasingly special collections. Books that are there for a reason, books that are unique to our collection, books that point to distinctive things about our institution. In other words, not discovery tools for all the riches of knowledge in the world, but marketing tools for all those riches teasers, things to get students interested, get them digging deeper than they would otherwise. The language I've been using for our renovation is that the building we emerge with should be a showplace for the institution, and it should be not the library, but a showroom for the library, a place where you meet the people, where you find the examples, where you are dazzled by the special collections that get you interested in what we have to offer and make you a smarter and better user of that collection even when you are not in our building. One of my mantras, ASU is a slightly special place, is that all of our students are already online students for the most part. Even the 10,000 who come through our building tomorrow are students who are mainly interacting with library resources online, half the time doing so in our building. We frequently, with our chat with a librarian link, find ourselves getting messages uh, sent to the chat with a librarian, online librarian, from people who are in our buildings. They can't get up and go walking around looking for a real librarian. Among other things, that gets you into the question of leaving your laptop and your iPad and your phone behind for somebody else to steal. Uh, but they're already treating the library as not the library at its physical space, but the library is their working space, and the real library they interact with is someplace else. We know how good and powerful that other library is. We're proud of it. And so we imagine that, we, that they are doing a smart thing. So let me now do a small case study of customer service in the modern university library. This is from the strap that we put around an interlibrary loan book when it arrives from one of our partner institutions. Let's see, this one doesn't even tell me where the partner institution is. No, of course not. Um, I pulled it out a couple of weeks ago when I was getting that book because I didn't like the implicit customer service experience embodied in the bold face down toward the bottom of that screen. Renewals are not permissible. $25 non-refundable late fee. I thought the non-refundable was a little excessive. Keep this strap on, capitals were a little excessive, to avoid penalty. So I talked to Access Services and they said, well, okay, yeah, okay, we keep talking about this, we try to make it better and clearer, but yeah, I said, what's the penalty if you take the strap off? What's going on there? <laughs> they said, well, okay, no, no, well, not really, a, well, but you see, the problem is, if you take the strap off, we have a problem. 
Pause for a moment. Anybody guess what the problem is if the strap goes away? You lose the barcode. TNQ138-8537. You also lose my name. The barcode is what you really want, but you might settle for my name. If I take that strap off and bring that book back and put it in the return book slot, I'm creating a problem. They don't know what this object is. Now that's funny in one respect because our modern library books are covered with numbers. If you got the right candidate, you could probably find one that had the accession number from when it was purchased, the original Dewey call number from what it was cataloged that way, the LC call number in which it was in, into which it was converted. If you got really lucky, you might even find one with a, with a computer punch card stuck in the back. It's probably got a barcode or a machine-readable number strip printed on it. That's what we now use for our circulation and handling. And it's a barcode strip on the front of the book. If the book has gone to our high-density shelving facility, guess what? It gets another number, another barcode, another strip in order to find it in the right box on the right shelf out there. But when the book goes traveling, when the book passes through TSA and makes it all the way to another library, all of those numbers strip away. They disappear. They are meaningless. And the only number that means anything is the new barcode number we put on the outside. So the explanation for the penalty was, well, if you did that, if you tore off the strip and you put it in the slot and you returned it at the end of the borrowing period, we might not be able to figure out where to send it back to in time for it to get back without you being charged for the late fee. Okay, one problem I have with that is that if our technology is creating the problem, punishing the user with a late fee seems to me like a bad idea. I pressed a little further and they couldn't remember when they'd last actually inflicted a penalty of this kind, but this is one of those, we want you to do something so we will threaten you. <laughs> Technologies. Well, that's a customer service experience we can improve upon. But it was the plant that pulled up the root that I was interested in, in what it says about the way we imagine our library collections. We imagine that we all work in libraries, plural. And in each one of those libraries, we have a whole bunch of stuff. We have a whole bunch of stuff lined up on shelves. And it's really, really important that we know every item of that stuff down to the item level. And that's a thing of beauty. That's how those stacks came about that we track and care for it uh, in perpetuity, ideally. Well, yes, we do accession, do deaccession things from time to time, but we make sure that none of the public sees us actually taking things out to the dumpster because that would be a problem. Um, if one of these books goes for a trip to another library, we spend some money sending it there, and we make darn sure we spend some more money sending it back. Budget rent a car doesn't do that. That's the first hint I'll give of where I'm going with this. Last budget rent a car I rented in San Francisco a few weeks ago had Idaho license plates on it. They trusted themselves to sort out and load balance and get material back where it belonged in time, but they didn't actually need to send that car back to Idaho the minute it was dropped off in San Francisco. We imagine, in other words, that we live with a whole lot of individual library collections and then it's really, really good and really, really nice that we cooperate with each other. And now I'll take this morning's first session and connect to that. We now also believe that we own and possess digital resources. Well, yeah, okay, we don't actually own and possess them. We're only leasing them and they're not actually anywhere in any building that belongs to us. But on the other hand, we have engaged in all of the obsessive compulsive behaviors that go with purchasing and importing that material. Um, even when we make our purchase through a multi-institutional consortium, we don't make one purchase together. We make 32 purchases with one purchasing agent going out there for us. And in 32 different institutions, folks like you have to worry about making sure that the stuff is there, that it's in our catalog, separate from any other catalog, that it's accessible through authentication systems, that when you log in from your campus IP address or your easy proxy or your VPN, that you can actually get to it because it's, in that sense, ours. And therefore, as many people as possible should be doing as much fussy work as possible in as many different buildings as possible in order 
so that users all over the country, indeed all over the world, can access the same data on the same servers that's actually owned by one single external vendor. My proposition to you is that time will come soon enough when we all don't just say this is nuts, it will really seem to be nuts and we will have found a way to get past that. My proposal is that we need to begin thinking not about ourselves as owners of thousands of different academic collections in thousands of different libraries around the United States and around the world, but rather as stewards and participants in creating a single library collection for a global community of scholars and users. Yes, that's what I mean by saying I'm going to be talking about what's impossible. Right now, we can't possibly imagine the way we go forward to get to that. But those journals and databases to which you are subscribing are a good first indicator that we've begun to move in that direction. This strip and its defects is my second indication that we know what the problem is and we could even imagine where the solution is. Yes, the book that arrives from the University of Nebraska Library is covered with numbers that we don't know about. But we could know about them. And it could be as simple as asking the sending library to tell us what the call number and the circulation barcode number are from your institution. The likely, that would create a combined number that would be absolutely unique in the library system. The possibility that the same call number and the same 12-digit barcode number would show up on a given individual item is so vanishingly small that if it ever happens, we can buy another copy of that book if we get confused about what, to, uh, about what to do with it. If we begin to think in those terms, we can begin to think of one collection. We can begin to extract data from our collections that enable us to save money and do a better job of our collections. When we do interlibrary loan now, we've begun to track the sending institution call numbers. Uh, we do a, a federated interlibrary, patron-initiated interlibrary loan called Borrow It Now with Gwila. And in that case, there's a relay overlay on top of Iliad that does populate the Iliad form with, your, with the call number of the sending institution. Why am I interested in the call number of the sending institution? Because that's patron-driven acquisition information of very high value. An interlibrary loan transaction is the most sincere way our patrons have of telling us what we don't have that they wish we had. And even if their call numbers are a little bit off from ours, they nevertheless tell us about the subject area. If I begin to see a lot of interlibrary loan books coming in with E99 call numbers, I should know that there's a boomlet of interest in Native American studies on my campus. And I should begin to think whether this means we've got a visiting professor this semester, it's a blip, or whether we've just hired some young hotshot in the history department who's going to be with us for 40 years doing good and important work and whose students need better support than we've been able to give them in the past. It's ironic to me, and I was puzzled, I was told when I first asked this question, that Iliad itself cannot tell you what the call number of the, from the sending library is. Um, I don't have details on this, but two or three weeks ago, I was told by someone who came back from a meeting that, well, yes, they have figured out a way in which you could extract the call number in ordinary Iliad transactions from a sending library and begin to manage numbers. If we manage those numbers together and look at what we're ordering, but if we also look at what we are finding in our interlibrary loan searches of where we can find books, how many we can find, we can begin to think collectively in a way we've not been able to do before about just how many copies of a given volume we need. I'll take you back to the discovery tools picture. To the extent we begin to move our collections and our stacks off-site, to the extent a larger and larger percentage of our books are no longer on those shelves, they are no longer discovery tools. You don't need them physically to be there in order to inspire your students. You can instead ask how many copies we, as a collectivity of academic institutions in Arizona, that's one cut we take, as research universities west of the Mississippi, that's another cut we take in Gwila, as 110 institutions in the West Regional Storage Trust, just how many copies we need in order to serve our users' demands as we design different kinds of discovery tools for our users to employ to find the material that we have 
They are already doing that. That is already the primary form of discovery our users follow. We need to make those tools better. If we begin to think that way collaboratively and default to the idea that we're talking about one collection, not thousands of collections, we can make better decisions, we can save money, we can preserve our print heritage better than we are now able to do, and we can serve our users better. And then we can think, I'm just going to linger here for a moment, this is a slightly fussy slide to see, but it's an important one. We can begin to think about the sort of stuff we haven't collected before. Um, this comes from the gang at OCLC, it's in a report by Lavoy, Malpass and Dempsey of a couple of years ago. And it's a two by two grid of the kind of stuff you collect in libraries. The vertical scale is uniqueness, special collections at the bottom, ordinary everyday stuff at the top. The horizontal scale is stewardship and, I'm not even quite reading the word, scarcity. Yes, sorry, what's the, what's the word? Stewardship and scarcity. Um, to the left are the things that require more stewardship and care and are rarer and harder to find. To the right are things that are commoner, sometimes common as dirt. Um, the four boxes contain special collections, traditional library special collections in the lower left, traditional library open stack content on the upper left. On the lower right, research and learning materials, the kind of things we're putting in our institutional repositories. And on the upper right, the open web. This is one way of imagining the totality of information that our users our academics, our students need to get at. Historically, we in libraries have done a good job on the left-hand side of that. We've done an outstanding job on the lower left. We've done a really, really good job on the upper left. We've done a eh, somewhat pretty good job on the lower right, but the lower right is a burgeoning neighborhood when all of our students are producing e-portfolios of their work when, during their time with us. That comes in that sector. The upper right, on the other hand, was almost empty in 1948 when the Princeton Library opened. It was stuff you could find instantaneously of high quality without having to go near a library. Well, in 1948, that was a pretty empty box. Now it's a very full box. And as we progress in our dream of making our collections openly and freely accessible to all users, of moving publishers to open access publishing models, more and more of the material that our students, users, and faculty will find valuable is appearing in that upper right-hand corner, and yet we have no robust tradition of cataloging, curating, making discoverable that material on terms comparable with what is on the left-hand side. That's a challenge for us going forward. If we really want to focus just on the stuff we own, just on the unique stuff, then 50 years from now, we will all be special collections librarians. We will be in that lower left-hand corner taking care of the unique items that we have at ASU and that you have wherever you may work. And our students, our faculty, our academic users will be turned loose to fend for themselves in the great world outside with tools that don't come from us, don't come from our profession necessarily. Uh, but come instead from the vendors who want to sell you something and sell you something more and sell you a service. They'll give you the content for free, perhaps, but then they'll find a way to charge you for the service. They'll give away razors so they can sell you a whole lot of razor blades. Uh, the challenge, I believe, for us facing us most of all in this century is to decide whether we want to take responsibility for as much of that box as we can or whether we want to subside into the lower left-hand corner. So I tell the story now of Ted Levitt. Ted Levitt was a famous professor at Harvard Business School for many, many years, just passed away a few years ago. I regret that I never had a chance to hear or see or meet him. In about 1960, he published a famous article called Marketing Myopia. You've heard about this article, whether you know it or not, because it's the source of the meme that says that if the railroads of the 1940s and 50s had known they were in the transportation business, more of them might be doing better now than are. It's a fascinating article, and I went and read it about 20 years ago when I first began hearing of it so much and wanted to track it down. Um, I give you the title and his name, Theodore Levitt, because if you've got access, you should go and have a look for it yourself. I think it's out there pretty easily on the open web, in fact, at this point. 
Um, it's an interesting and important article, both for what it says about railroads, that's the first half of the article, in which he looks back at how the railroads got in trouble. And then he selects another industry, vintage 1960, that he thinks is going to be in trouble because they don't get it about what their business really is. I won't tell you what that business is, but I'll just say this. I first read this article about 20 years ago, and I laughed. I said, so the great prophet, one out of two, not bad. Dead wrong on the second half of his article. 20 years later, I'm now inclined to think he was dead right in the second half of his article. So it's an interesting exercise in that way for framing how we think about history, how we think about the long term. But his question is, how do you know what business you are in? I propose to you this triage. I don't nail this to the mast of my, of my whaling ship. It's a rough triage, but it's a way of thinking about who we are and where we are. Information storage and retrieval. That's a good word for what we've always done, no matter how well we've done it or how poorly we've done it. Libraries are imagined globally as places where you store information and you go and fetch it back. Discovery has always been our second task. As soon as there were more than 50 books, finding the book you were looking for got complicated. We've gotten better at discovery over the years with each high-tech innovation. But I'm proposing that we remember to think about the third thing we have always done. One way to put this would be to say reference librarianship. But there aren't as many reference librarians sitting at reference desks as there used to be. Um, at Arizona State University, we score extra points for every time we can use the word entrepreneurship in a PowerPoint. <laughs> so that put me thinking in a particular way. The feature of our behavior, our resources, our strength that I'm pointing to there is our ability to be the place, be the people where you go when you don't know what to do next. You're forming a question. You're chasing information. You don't quite know how to shape the question. You don't quite know what to do about it you don't know how to sustain it. That's the traditional function of the reference librarian. It's the traditional function of our libraries when they're performing at their highest and best. And my final real suggestion for us today is that we think about the future of our activity as one in which we try to concentrate as much of our time, resource, talents, and effort at the bottom of that scale and routinize and industrialize and commodify the top of that scale to the greatest extent possible. Because otherwise, what we do will not scale up to a global audience. So there I return to my initial question. How many libraries do we need? 119,000, I ask. Where would I come up with that number? Well, 119,000 is the number you find on the ALA website for the number of libraries there are in the United States today. That's not bad, all things considered. It means that approximately one out of every 3,000 people in the United States on that scale must be a director of a library. That's pretty good. Um, asterisk, asterisk, of course this counts. Special libraries, corporate libraries, variety of things. It's an inclusive count. It captures branches of public libraries and so forth. But it's still a reassuring thing to think we've got 119,000 points of contact. What I've been suggesting is that in some important way, we should be imagining that we have, as collectors of, and storers of information, a single library. There is, in the long run, no good reason why any human being on the planet should be denied access to information of value to them in shaping and managing their lives, in pursuing the questions that are important to them. Historically, it had to be discriminatory. Historically, there were only a few hundred copies of a given book, and they had to be in particular places, and you had to manage access to them. Those days are gone. Getting at that kind of information will always be a bit more challenging, but with digitization, even that becomes easier. But the commodity information of the highest value the scholarship, the research, even the entertainment, the light fiction, is all in principle readily available inches away from any citizen on the planet who's got their hands on an electronic device. I'll go back to the first session this morning when it was described how a faculty member may be impatient 
when they ask for streaming video and are, for their class and are told that it can't be gotten within a few days or a few hours because their expectations have been shaped by a world in which for 99 cents you can get it right now. On the one hand, those difficulties today are real. On the other hand, that expectation that we are now the objects of is a reminder that there's no good excuse for those objections to remain real, no reason why we should not be able to smooth and, and streamline access to information for every human being on the planet. But that takes me in another direction. If you look at the forward-thinking optimists uh, for the 21st century, and some days it's a kind of a tough century to be optimistic about, but they think we can stabilize the population of the planet perhaps somewhere around 9 billion. The growth curve is in fact slowing. There's all kinds of challenges with imagining that you could ever stabilize the planet. We have so become habituated to a model of growth according to which we need more people to make more stuff to keep the population alive and happy. Stabilizing a population also tends to age it, which means there are fewer young people around to work hard to take, to take care of the old people. Be that as it may, there are serious folks who say nine billion. So if we take the 308 million people in the United States today, divide by 119,000, factor in nine billion, that's where I get to the number of three million. If you took a nine billion person planet and gave it libraries on a per capita basis such as we now enjoy in the United States of America, you're going to need three million library directors around the globe by the end of the 21st century. I take that to be good news. I doubt we'll ever actually get to that kind of number. But if we think in those terms, we will recognize the difference between how many libraries we need if we are imagining appropriate collection, stewardship, and management of content versus how many libraries we need if we do at a high level with a high degree of success our inquiry, entrepreneurship, our reference librarian job for all the people on the planet who deserve it. That's a future that if we can move away from obsessive connection with content location by location, emphasize our services, emphasize making the value of our services visible to the population, that's a world we can imagine, a world with three million libraries in it. I like that number. Thank you all, you've been very patient. I look around, time for a few questions, microphones out there. Go ahead. Right. So when I think about library cooperation, it often proceeds along like three different paths. One is um, they might cooperate because they have a similar geographic area and it's easier to share physical resources if you're close together. Another is if you have shared licensing and budget concerns where you can only use certain pots of money within certain organizations or you might have to include you know, certain state legal provisions in a license or um, you know, if you're part of a university system. And another is uh, collecting needs and subject focus. And often these three kind of are at odds with each other where you might have a state consortium that makes a lot of sense for legal and budget concerns, but then you know, it includes very small liberal arts colleges as well as you know, some of the largest research institutions in the country. And I just wonder how you reconcile these different kinds of needs as you look at you know, large-scale cooperation. I think we should give ourselves credit for the progress that we have made. Uh, there are relatively few businesses, including higher education as a whole, in which we so little compete with each other and so much cooperate with each other. Um, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog out there world to get 18-year-olds to show up on your campus. Uh, but it's not, in fact, in rooms like this, a dog-eat-dog -dog world in which we're trying to outdo other libraries and do them down in one form or another. Um, consortial purchasing of electronic resources has been, what, a stunning success. Absolutely stunning success, no question about it. 25 years ago in this room, you could barely imagine doing stuff like that. Um, and it brings its problems with it. Um, it brings big deal problems with it, it brings exactly the kind of licensing and location-based um, issues that you're talking about. I was startled again by our colleague earlier this morning who said that the money has to come from Albany for State University of New York things. 
Um, absolutely true, totally nuts, on the other hand. We should focus, I believe, as a profession on identifying the things that are most totally nuts that we can do something about and try to denutsify them because the, the amount of time and effort and, and human ingenuity that is wasted um, on trying to get that stuff done is immense. I'll go back to the very first thing I said. Uh, yes, those obstacles are real. Um, I would then say we have made remarkable progress with them. Um, the other elephant in the room that needs to learn to dance is that we need to be able to get to a point where we can digitize on demand for, at least for scholarly and academic use, a much higher percentage of materials than we have now. I want that high density shelving facility we have to be one where the default retrieval mechanism is we feed it to a scanner and we send it to you in two hours. Or we fish out the copy that we did the last time we fed it to a scanner and send it to you in, in 20 minutes. Um, and we have a little checkbox that says, no, no, I really want to see the, uh, uh, the physical object, and we could do that for you in 24 or 48 hours. I strongly believe the point at which we can do that has to come. I think we're close to a tipping point where we can make some difference. Um, I think authors and publishers are beginning to realize that if they don't make their content available digitally on some kind of reasonable terms, it's going to disappear, it's not going to be used ever again, and they have an opportunity. I am very guardedly hopeful that with a new Librarian of Congress, someday real soon, please, please, um, we would have a convening authority that could get people to talk realistically about terms for that. At the same time, you may well know, there is a move on to take the Copyright Office away from LC. Um, I think that is that is bad news, and the last too long prolonged librarianship of Congress may be most negatively remembered for enabling that moment to come if it comes. But even if it comes, uh, in a sense, the librarian would be liberated from responsibility for enforcing copyright and making restrictive decisions of a kind that the Copyright Office is too often made and maybe the bully pulpit can be a better, a better bully pulpit. I mean, just one concrete example. Um, I am thinking of a five volume book by a distinguished scholar, five volumes published in the 1970s and 1980s. I know the family. I'm talking to them about the future of that important scholarly work, which was written for scholars but is accessible to a much wider audience than just scholars. It has to do with the history of Christianity. Uh, at the moment, that book is available from Abe Books or in paperback from the University Press that published it. There is no digital representation available unless you go to Sci-Hub, in which case you can find it both in English and in, who knew, Romanian translation. Um, it's in the family's interest, it's in our interest for that book to stay alive and be accessible on some terms or another. I'd love it to be uh, available through open access, of course. I'd also be happy to pay the free market value for every use I make of it. I think the free market value for every use I make of it is going to be five or ten cents. There's probably an economic model in which you could have a revenue stream that would nevertheless uh, be a realistic long tail revenue stream for, uh, for users. Um, someday someone will invent the Apple Store for books and content and we'll be able to pay five or ten cents or 99 cents instead of $32 an article that we, we do now. Um, give me a hundred year perspective and I say that absolutely has to happen. Give me a five year perspective on it and I say it ain't happening anywhere near as fast as I'd like it to happen. Between five and a hundred now we're negotiating. <laughs> yeah, Steve. Uh, I'd like to ask for clarification on your point um, which was that we need to focus on the intellectual or the the entrepreneurial inquiry, uh, entre sorry, I can't even speak about it. It must be jargon, good. <laughs> are, are you therefore then thinking that uh, all of the work that goes into making things accessible is less significant? No. Because if you are, I, I have tr trouble with that. I, no. I think that there are, there is a huge amount of intellectual work that goes into making things discoverable that remains a tremendously important task. It doesn't happen 
magically in industry. Uh, it doesn't happen magically in libraries. So that's why I wanted to ask for clarification. No, no, by no means less important, but more readily industrializable, more readily federatable. Um, the process of producing information got a whole lot easier when print was introduced. Monasteries didn't have to copy the stuff. Um, they were a little grumpy about it at the time, some of them. I've written about that. But on the other hand, uh, it made it possible for information to travel more widely in, in fact, higher quality uh, packaging than was often the, case, uh, often the case before that. Simply to say that we can reorganize the way in which we do things in order to free up as much talent for uh, the inevitably customizable, personable sort of tasks doesn't take away from the importance of what goes before. Right now, I think on that, um, if I just go back to that, on my three function list, I think the place where we should be putting fire engine attention is on discovery. I think that's, uh, there is simply too much out there, too much is not being used, people are not finding their way to stuff, and we can't do discovery in the traditional reference library in one at a time mode before advising every student how to navigate, uh, how to navigate the open web. That's where we need industrialization, that is to say tools that personalize the individual user, let the user have a higher chance of finding the stuff they're really looking for right now. That's 2016. 20 years ago you wouldn't have said that, and 20 years from now with luck we'll say we're doing better there and the focus now is on how we reach um, every single one of those 9 billion people with what they need and that's going to be the, the critical difficulty at that stage. Yes, sir. Hi, Adolfo Tarango, University of British Columbia. Um, I'm glad Steve asked this question, and I'm glad you focused, brought us back to the importance of discovery. Um, I'm, I was sitting back there trying to think of how I could um, politely <laughs> raise this, this issue, because to me, um, it's, I'm, I'm so glad that you are taking this stance because I, I, I totally buy this thing and I, and I appreciate the clarity uh, that, that you gave and, uh, regarding the importance of discovery because at least in my 15 years of trying to come up with ideas in terms of, uh, from the cataloging um, standpoint and trying to increase and promote the discovery of the materials um, has been the challenge of going to my administrators the people up and explaining the value of metadata in particular in enabling discovery and as we move to uh, move these things off site to work with other people, how much more important um, the metadata creation and the description of these items uh, becomes and yet at the same time, who here hasn't lost catalogers over the last several years? And, and so, yeah. I, I really, what I really want to say is, can you and go out and talk to the administrators who control our budget to, to because, I, because I, I do, I, I, I buy into everything. I think you're right, and I think this is, yes, the, the way we should go in in terms of, particularly the metadata creation. We need to come up with better, faster, more batch processes that allows us to share the metadata across institutions instead of each of us individually creating that, uh, but we need the support from higher up to, to understand the importance of that, um, to enable this vision to, to happen. I entirely agree. I would just say we've made vast progress in that direction already. Imagine if we were still doing original cataloging of every item that comes into our buildings, uh, one building at a time. Uh, this is multiple generations already have found the appropriate way. The task isn't less important but the task is getting done better because we have federated that way. I would say, and I have some experience and, and knowledge of how this plays, we make our best story to administration when we can encourage them to think that we are being as creative as possible in the use these days of technology to facilitate and, uh, and to collaborate in our work. Um, if I go to senior administration and say cooperative collection development is a dream that's never really quite come true, they will look at me and say unacceptable. And they will be right to say that and I will have been right to say what I've said. That's a zone in which we need to work together uh, in order to do better than we have done before and, uh, and build, 
build credibility for what we're doing. Um, I would, I have a wonder, and this is not something that I'm prepared to work on or think about seriously at this time, but a wonder of where 20 years from now things will shake out and the production of metadata between librarians, not-for-profit institutions, and the for-profit manipulators of information. Uh, Amazon right now is tied with Google for the world lead in producing really lousy metadata. Um, they are getting into difficulties of their own. Think about your Amazon search today and your Amazon search 10 years ago. You do an Amazon search on something today, you're finding a lot of garbage that you didn't used to find. And you're having more trouble sorting through it and finding the thing you're looking for. Um, we can look at it and say, I can tell you what the problem is. Uh, the best clue on this, I think it was in Gary Price's um, email list a couple of weeks ago, uh, the best hint for getting a better Amazon search today than you get otherwise, because there's all the self-published stuff and all the print-on-demand stuff, click on the little button for same-day delivery with Prime, because that gets you Amazon's own selection of what the good stuff is, what the first order stuff is that's really worth looking at, and not all the other stuff that fills up their search. Try it yourself. My point is that I could imagine a point at which either Amazon or Google or a yet third party um, uh, commercial source would say, it's getting too messy, we've got to find ways to technologize and standardize, make the commercial sector that's producing stuff do a better job of presenting it to us in a way that makes it easier for us to intake it. A um, hundred years ago, they didn't do any of that, and cataloging was entirely our job. We've pushed a fair amount of that work towards the, the vendor community, the publisher community. I think, ideally, we could publish, we could push it in a further direction. And I'll put that in the, in the category with the other impossible things I've said have to happen. Going once, going twice. Yes. That's a good way to get another one. My name is Margarita and I'm from Oregon State University. And I have a question about the discoverability. We all know that we need to make our resources uh, discoverable and accessible. That's truly important. But in order for students to discover it, we have to do some sort of marketing out there. We have to advertise what we have in the library and also you know, do outreach with other departments. I mean, and I don't think that is a strength that some of us have. And I'm wondering, what is your opinion on that and how would you suggest we go about that? I have a hypothesis rather than an opinion and check me in a couple of years and we'll see how it goes. Um, ASU is a wonderful place to work in a variety of ways, one of which is that right there in our boldly emblazoned university charter, it says, we define our success by whom we include rather than by whom we exclude. Uh, and it's important for diversity, it's important for the ambition of the institution. This means we've got lots of students, we're getting lots more online, face to face. Um, I came in and, and student success, the success of those students is a high priority in the institution. We measure uh, retention of freshmen, four years to degree, six years to degree, those kind of standard, standard measures. I came in and said to my staff, so if the president came in tomorrow and said, what are you folks doing for student success? I got a vaguely deer in the headlights look and somebody said, well, we've got two subject librarians who work with undergraduates. I said, yeah, 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 yeah. I don't think the president's gonna think that's a good answer. So we're, in the, we're moving toward a reorganization to focus on student success, measured in those terms. My hypothesis is that we will succeed in the first instance there, not by working with students. One of those stu works with students librarians seems to spend her entire life in our classroom talking to sections of English 101 over and over and over again. Um, that doesn't scale. Instead, we need to be looking at that category of people on our campuses who showed up when I think most of us weren't looking and are called instructional designers. We may have more of them than other institutions do because we have a very ambitious online education um, operation. The online education department employs no librarians, lots of instructional designers. 
Those are the people who work with faculty to take the imagined structure of a course and put it into a pedagogical model to provide resources, to organize the digital tools. That's the place where I want us to go next. Meet all of those, have all of our subject librarians that meet all of the instructional designers and figure out what the difference is between those two categories. I think there's a significant overlap in that. And if we succeed in working with our faculty to design courses, design assignments in courses, start by asking what are the 20 courses at ASU that are the biggest challenges to freshman retention? Let's go there. Let's talk to those faculty about how they're giving assignments that use library materials, how we can work with them to help them design and structure their assignments. So we're not doing a lib guide for uh, Civil War history, but we're doing that kind of work for History 112, the course that students all have to take, and it is then customized and tailored there. We do some of that now. We've got some course specific uh, lib guides. But that, it seems to me, needs to be, no, it needs to be. My hypothesis is that that's a sweet spot where we can leverage the work of our too few librarians to maximum benefit for maximum number of students and construct ways in which in their freshman and sophomore years, they're introduced to the possibilities that we have to offer uh, and then begin to use them better and begin to approach us with questions that we are readier to answer. Uh, my other answer is building design. Um, as we do this renovation I spoke of, we're very carefully thinking about our entrances, what you see when you walk in the door, if you're just coming in to do your calculus homework, um, what things will dazzle your eye as you go by and entice you and intrigue you and give you a sense of possibilities beyond what you had before you came there. Designing that print collection is one part of that. I don't want the print collection to be Anglophone bestsellers of the last 30 years. I want it to include foreign language books, books about subjects you've never heard of before, um, funky, slightly scary scholarship um, that nevertheless will hook you in so that when you slow down to look at it, it's not like going to a Barnes and Noble, it's like going to a place you've never been before. We are a place they've never been before, we gotta sell that. Hello, Betsy Appleton, St. Edwards University. I have a question because we are an e-preferred library. We only, oh, sorry? We are an e-preferred library. We only buy books, or will we buy books in, in electronic form um, if we can and print if we can't. Um, every time I talk to faculty, they tell me how much they hate this. And I, 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 it's really, I kind of want to say, well, what else are we going to do? We have a tiny library. We don't have space to grow. Um, I, I'm trying to figure out the, the balance between the impossibility of discovery online is so much better in a lot of ways, but then the, the use online hasn't caught up. And I was wondering uh, if you could say I something I absolutely about agree that. with you. If you're not careful, you're going to get my 45-minute rant on that subject. <laughs> we are also, for domestic uh, book purchases, we are strongly e-preferred, uh, and we hate it, and I hate it, uh, for a whole variety of reasons. I think the things we now call e-books that we use in libraries stink. Uh, they are not functional. Um, I'll take you back to that book of uh, the famous scholar. If I have a choice at any given moment between the expensive e-book that we have purchased and have legitimate access to through the Arizona State University Library, and a hastily done, blurry on some pages, bootleg PDF from Sci-Hub. I will choose the blurry PDF because it has higher functionality for me than the, you can download 36 pages at a time, you can print 29 pages at a time, um, one user can check it out for 14 days, Oh, by the way, log into your EBSCO account here so you can take notes. Um, all of that, I'm going to use a technical term here of scholarship that may not be familiar in librarianship, all of that crap is just <laughs> an, a set of annoyances imported in order to desperately find a business model that can enable this to work. Can't last, can't sustain. Uh, there are people working on it, but uh, right now, I think the stuff we bring in as ebooks is is just painful. I know one publisher who says, 
I agree with you, and I think the e-books we're selling you are discovery tools. You can find information quickly that way. You can find what you're looking for that way, but they're not really serious kind of tools. Maybe, this is fantasy now, there's an alternate ecology of this where print on demand becomes so cheap, so accessible, so easy, that we do use the digital form as discovery and if you can stand it, reading, but then be able to acquire a cheap, serviceable printed copy in your library when you want it and throw it away when you're done with it and get another one some other time when you, uh, when you do that. Um, that would be a real change in the way we imagine books. Um, it would also require changes in the way we imagine publishing books and paying for them. That is a real impossibility we've run up against now. So when we get those E things and look at them, uh, we should say these are nuts and we should be denutsifying it, but right now it's a, it's a real struggle. Well, thank you. The airport is that way. I think a bunch of us will be discovering that. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>